It's the co-founder of Unlocked and former Brexit Party MEP, Ben Habib. Hello, Ben. Hi, good evening. How are you? Um, good. Uh, what's the situation? Uh, we uh, said that this was the deadline day, D-Day. If we hadn't come to an arrangement or an agreement with the EU, we would walk away. Uh, this was the day. Guess what? We haven't walked away. Another Boris promise not kept. Uh, how do you read this situation? What would your analysis be uh, for why we have gone back on our pledge to walk away? Well, I think it's a bit early to judge whether or not we're going to walk away or not. I think Boris is due to make an announcement tomorrow morning. And I wait with bated breath to see what he has to say, because as you rightly identify, this is about the fourth or fifth deadline when we should have just, you know, up sticks, ceased negotiations and exited the negotiating rooms. And I really hope that having had the proverbial two fingers from the EU, which is precisely what we got today, that he has the courage, the dignity, the imagination, the vision and the planning to just give them the proverbial one finger back and leave. Yeah, but, but he's you... right to delay it one day if he thinks it's possible that he can get a deal tomorrow. It's a little brinkmanship, isn't it? <laughs> Add just one day and then that's it. Do you think, do you think Ben, uh, that... Uh, David Frost, our negotiator, our chief negotiator, oh. is indicating to Boris, look, hang around, I think we're within sight yeah. of a deal. Would that be your interpretation? No, I think the tweet from David Frost that I read this evening was basically the EU ain't budging. Von der Leyen's gone back on her word of trying to intensify talks, trying to get a deal done quickly. She's saying now they're going to more or less take their time. All this, by the way, was predictable. We could have, you know... The Brexit Party did predict all of this back last year, that you know, they will play it long. They'll try and get the transition period extended. Why wouldn't they? They get one billion pounds a month for our continued membership of the single market. So they're going to play it long. They're going to test our mettle. And the question now is whether the prime minister has the courage and, as I say, the vision, planning and execution to leave with a no deal. It's not just about courage. It's about has Michael Gove and has the team around Michael Gove, who's in charge of no deal planning, actually got their act together so that tomorrow morning he can pull the plug and with confidence lead the United Kingdom out of the European Union. Are they ready for, for that? All. Could they? Could we do that? And would it be OK? Well, that is that is my concern. And, you know, one of the things that one of the things I'm chairman of is something called Brexit Watch. And we've been saying since January that really that the, the government should be vocally planning for a no deal exit it's not sufficient just to plan for it behind closed doors you've got to plan for it in the open so that the electorate can see that the uk is ready to exit and exit well and we've heard nothing about no deal planning we've got no idea what sort of vision boris johnson has for a post-brexit united kingdom you know, we, I, I've got a very clear vision of what I think it should be. I think it should be a, a lower taxation, uh, lightly regulated, a highly uh, competing, perhaps tariff imposing United Kingdom, one that's out there to win the international competition for trade. But we haven't heard anything of that from the prime minister. We haven't really seen a vision for no deal Brexit. So it'll be very interesting to see how he reacts tomorrow morning. But undoubtedly, what we've had today is two fingers from the EU and we must react as we should do as a proud nation. Yes, uh, I would agree. Uh, last time I looked, Ben, uh, the French in particular were digging their heels in about uh, the fishing rights situation, uh, which does seem yeah. to be a massive sticking point. Uh, the ludicrous assumption by the EU that uh, although we gain control of our sovereign seas, our sovereign waters, uh, we have to let boats from France uh, Scandinavia, Spain, fish in our waters, and we can have no say on that. That's patently absurd, but apparently the French are leading the fight on this and saying they will not budge. Now, we can't budge on that either. We have to say these are our sovereign seas. Yes, we'll let you fish in them, but you have to do it on our terms. You have to obey our Absolutely. regulations. Uh, but it does seem that, the, uh, that Europe uh, won't budge on this very... Uh, obvious point. If they won't compromise on yeah. that, we are doomed, aren't we? I mean, it's a very interesting subject, the fishing one, from the European perspective, because, of course, if we do leave without a deal, they get absolutely no access to our waters. And so what Macron is saying is much more 
then we insist on access to your waters. What he's actually saying is that we're going to rub the United Kingdom's nose in the dirt as far as this deal is concerned. And we don't believe for a second that you're prepared to leave without one. That's what he's really saying when he insists on access to our waters, because the logical corollary of what he's saying, uh, if we leave without a deal, is that he gets no access. So he's actually using this to test whether or not we've got the courage to stand our ground. And we mustn't give in to it. it it's, as you say, it's utterly ridiculous that we shouldn't have a total control of our fishing waters. And oh. that, just to remind you, on the 19th of December 2019, the Prime Minister stood up in Parliament and he said, the EU will have no more than annual access to our waters determined by the United Kingdom every year at our sole discretion based on our needs, not theirs. Well, if they don't budge on the fishing dispute, uh, then it proves to me anyway, I don't know what you think, Ben, that they're, they're, they're being deliberately... Uh, abs obstructive, obstructive, here. because Absolutely. because the the proposition is absurd that yeah. that uh, that they carry on exactly as it is now uh, yeah. when we're a part of the EU uh, after we leave the EU and yeah. we take uh, back control of our waters that, that that cannot be the case it's absolutely unreasonable. But that's why to I thought we, we're always going to have to leave with the the world trade rules and then we're going to have to negotiate from there. Because they're never going to give Absolutely. in, are they? They're never going to give in. Absolutely. Well, I, that, that is the right way to have done it. Yeah, well, as well, you suggest, leave on WTA and then negotiate. And then do the deal, yeah. Uh, yeah. So w w what would you predict? Uh, we've touched on it, but what do you think he's going to say tomorrow, Ben? Well, it, I, I honestly don't know. I think he's at a fork in the road, which he's never been at before. He's, he, he's got an 80-seat majority. He can deliver pretty much whatever he decides he wishes to deliver. And now he's got the European Union doing what many of us predicted it would do, which is put two fingers up to the UK. And he's got to now muster every Churchillian cell in his body to stand up for the United Kingdom and not be browbeaten by this supranational entity that has treated us with scant re respect for the last four years, humiliated us at every turn. He's got to do it. Whether he has the courage, and I say the planning and wherewithal, that's very important as well, to do it tomorrow morning remains to be seen. But I really hope he does it. In many ways, by the way, I'm very pleased the EU's taken this position because it gives the Prime Minister bi a, a binary choice. It's all been very grey before, but now he has a yeah. very clear choice. Leave without a deal or be browbeaten all the way to 31st December 2020 with everyone knowing that they gave us the two fingers up and we didn't have the courage to walk. Well, he's going to have to be uh, pretty definitive in whatever he says because he can't stand up there tomorrow and say, right, uh, I've got this deadline and if we don't do a deal by <laughs> October the 25th, yeah. you know, uh, you can't keep uh, you can't creating keep the, these deadlines no. and then and then uh, not meeting the deadlines. So in some ways he's yeah. already snookered himself. The so red lines, he's got a lot, you know, yeah. next couple of days and that's it. Yeah. Uh, he has. Well, I very much hope he will do the right thing and the right thing is to leave on WTO terms yes. now. That is yeah. the right thing. And, 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 and he's also got to tear up the withdrawal agreement. We mustn't forget that that withdrawal agreement puts a border down the RSC, commits the United Kingdom in many respects to alignment with EU state aid laws and Northern Ireland to all sorts of other regulations. And we've got to leave, as he promised in his manifesto, as the whole of the United Kingdom leaving at the same time. And so if we go for no deal tomorrow, tomorrow morning, which I very much hope he will, he will also declare in favour of ripping up the withdrawal agreement. We should never have signed it. It was a deal he said he would never sign. And now we must rip it up. Well, as Nigel Farage says, the withdrawal agreement is actually a sort of contract for us kind of remaining in the EU. Yeah, it's yeah. a deal for us still to be attached to that organisation. Uh, so it's not an exit deal in uh, some critics' view. It's a sort of uh, retainer deal where we sort of remain part of that uh, European operation. Absolutely. So that's not good enough, is it? No. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. You'll recall, recall the debate of the Internal Market Bill recently. And the Internal Market Bill, um, when it was announced in Parliament, was announced by um, Brandon Lewis, uh, accepting that we were breaking international law. And the reason he had to accept that we were breaking international law 
Well, there are two reasons. The first is it does break international mm -hmm. law. It breaches yeah. Article 4 of the Withdrawal Agreement, which gives the European Court of Justice supreme uh, hegemony over, uh, over the UK's judiciary. But, but he also had to do it to make sure that the UK's courts understood that in any future determination of a dispute between the EU and the United Kingdom, that Parliament had intended to break international law when it passed that bill. Yeah. And that says it all about the withdrawal agreement. He had to accept that we were breaking international law because that was what was required to get out of that. Get and out it of shows that Parliament. Agreement. Parliament has final say, and it doesn't matter about anyone. Else. And it shows yeah. that Parliament has yeah. final say. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, um, I mean, and, 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 it wasn't our yeah. finest hour to uh, sign that uh, Irish deal. That was a it was a basically yeah. a mistake. But I do think that that we did the right thing in the end. You know, you don't want to just say, oh, my God, we can't get out of that. We yeah. had to get out of it. And by the way, you know, I know all about, oh, it's terrible. Britain will, won't be seen like an honest broker. Oh, dear, yeah. we've broken international laws. Let me tell you, Ben, there aren't many citizens of Great Britain who are losing too much sleep on whether or not yeah. we've broken international law. That is uh, for the uh, sort of uh, ideologues and not for the real world, isn't it? I, I completely agree. And actually, you've got to go back. If you want to talk about the breach of the uh, of international law, you've got to go back to the Article 50 process, which entitles any country, any member state of the European Union to leave pursuant to its own constitutional requirements. And actually, throughout the Article 50 process of negotiating that withdrawal agreement, the European Union exploited the difficult... Yeah, it was an unreasonable contract. It it was an unreasonable contract. It was struck when we were on our knees and they helped put us on our knees. They conspired with the Liberal Democrats. They conspired with Burko. They conspired with Labour. They, they absolutely, you talk about foreign powers interfering in the Brexit process. Well, the EU was at it. It had its thumb, fingers, hands fully in our, in our cake. And yeah. um, uh, so, you know, when it comes to judging whether or not we broke international law, frankly, that pales by significance compared to the malpractice perpetrated by the European Union. So I really hope we can now put an end to the four years of misery we've been through and tear up that wretched withdrawal agreement, which the Prime Minister described as a surrender agreement. Yes. Tear it up and leave without a deal eventually cleanly. And then, as you said, come back and negotiate from a position of strength. Do you, how much do you blame the French for this? Because Macron uh, has uh, caused all sorts of problems for, for us, uh, Great Britain, throughout these negotiations. Uh, it is the French who are leading uh, this uh, intransigent position on the fishing rights. Uh, they're the ones who will not budge on it. Uh, is this in the end, or the troubles we're going through in these talks, is, is this in the end down to that traditional Gallic hatred of the Anglo-Saxons? <laughs> I think there's undoubtedly, you know, a degree of that. But I suspect that Macron and Merkel are working very closely together. You know, if you cast your mind back again, it's a slightly tangential subject, but an important one. When the German Constitutional Court ruled that the European Court of uh, the European Central Bank had acted ultra vires by buying so many government bonds, um, the French and the Germans immediately got together and made a political pact to find a way round the Karlsruhe court's ruling. And I, I think there's a lot of complicity between the Germans and the French, who effectively run Europe. You know, it may be 27 member states, but it's, uh, it, it, it's actually the Germans and the French. It's for German the industry and, I, and French farmers, isn't it? It is. It's the German industry and French farmers, and they call yeah. the shots. And Merkel and, and, and Macron work very closely together. So... I think that it may be Macron who's put front and centre in order to be the sort of Gallic pain in the backside for the UK. <laughs> but yeah. I think he's got he's got Merkel right behind him. Don't forget, it's Macron and Merkel's Europe. It's their EU. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, no one yeah. else. Can, is, yeah. No one else controls that yeah. organisation. Yeah, so uh, so, we're, so we're yeah. on the edge of our seats, Ben. For whatever Boris may say tomorrow, uh, it's an intriguing situation. And I thank you for helping us uh, bring it up to date. So far, thank you so much, yeah, Ben. Man. That's Ben Habib, co founder of Unlocked and a former Brexit Party MEP, on our latest situation with the Brexit talks. Big announcement.